Hi, welcome to Get Used To It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host, and today I have a real treat for you. Uh, as you know, we if you watch the show, we have uh, uh, a series, a sort of occasional series that we call Voices of Our Lives, where we talk to people, just one person for a whole hour, who have been um, important to our community, who've accomplished goals for our community, or just are of interest to our uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual community. And today I'm really pleased to have this time to talk with Morris Kite. Morris Kite, who for 40 years here in Los Angeles, but really nationally, has been not only a leader, not only an activist in our community, but really one of our guiding uh, philosophers and really one of our guiding angels. Uh, this is a man who has put his life and energy into our community. And there are, I, I think there's not virtually one institution in Los Angeles that would exist had it not been for Morris's work and guidance and leadership. A community organizer by, uh, well, profession by avocation. Welcome, Morris. I'm just delighted. It's so pleasing. I love this set. Isn't it nice? It, it feels I'm at home. That's Alice B. Toklas and Gertrude yes. Stein. There's Christopher Isherwood, isn't it? Yes. And the covers of one. How daring they were, <laughs> how daring they were in the mid-50s to be publishing Gee Whiz. Well, speaking of daring, I mean, even though your sort of uh, career with our community has uh, started in the mid-50s, I'd like to get a little bit of background about who Morris Kite is and where he came from, because there were some years before uh, the time that you at least sort of burst on the scene here um, where, where did you come from? Where were you I born? I was born in Proctor, Texas, in Comanche County, 19 November 1919, to a mother and father, and I had a sister and a brother. Uh, it was the dead of winter. Uh, the uh, house had one heated room, and a midwife came from Comanche, the county seat seven miles uh, east, to bring me. And the following day, my mother and father said to her, we know you get paid and you deserve it. We're short of money, we have six dollars. We'd like to give you the six dollars and name him for you. Her name was Virginia Morris, and that's how I got to be Morris. It's in Jewish, Moses. In Spanish, Moses. In French, Morris. In English, Moshe Amash. And I think there's a connection there. I've well, I think there may be. Yeah, you know. But what was it like growing up in Texas? Well, I learned very all, early on uh, that it wasn't okay to be gay. Uh, I learned very early on that that wasn't something you talked about. My consciousness grew fairly fast. I don't want to overemphasize it. Fairly fast. I was conscious that I was different and that that was nothing to talk about because you'd be beaten up or driven out of town or harassed or something. And so uh, I went about pursuing other things. I wasn't welcome to the games. There were sports games at school, and I wasn't welcome. They indicated everywhere in the world that I shouldn't play. And there were also sex games. And while Comanche, Texas was in the Puritan South, there was lots of sexual activity going on. And I wasn't welcome to that. And rather than to become uh, any kind of delinquent, I filled up the time by writing poetry, reading poetry, plowing and farming and growing things. I traveled a lot all around that section, and I would fill my pockets with seeds and bring them home and plant them on our farm. And uh, there were gullies, and I dammed those up as a kid with a shovel, carrying sticks of wood and making little dams. I last saw that farm in 1962, and uh, the ryegrass had grown shoulder high, hmm. and it was a forest, and it was a cottonwood blowing in the wind. Do you know cottonwoods? Mm -hmm. The leaf is so delicate, so lovely. You know? mm -hmm. Like uh, blowing in the wind, aspen, sixty feet of... tall, and I thought, gee whiz, I planted that. <laughs> I went away knowing I'd never see it again, but I can see it as clearly as if it were yesterday. Now, did you know? Even as a, as a very young boy or man, did you know others that? you thought were homosexual, or that you knew? Was there talk about any in your not, town? Not in high school, though I was having sex games. Uh, I was having sex, sexual activities with a number of my classmates 
uh, we didn't talk about it, didn't dignify it, didn't mention it, it was just done and then you went on. However, I moved to Fort Worth, Texas in 1937 to enroll in Texas Christian University and there I commenced to meet homosexuals. The word gay wasn't used. Now it may have been used in New York or Paris or London, but out in the wilds of Texas it wasn't used. However, I gradually got to know enough gay people to rise and rise there was a, or homosexual, an underground of activity, a kind of an in-group. You didn't talk about it publicly, but you practiced privately. And I kind of was, I had entree there, uh, but wasn't up to the dignity of being gay. It wasn't. It, it was quite the opposite of dignity, wasn't it? Did yeah, you feel ashamed? Were you made out. to feel ashamed? And the worst thing that could happen to you was to be found out. It was just unspeakable. Dear, I've been found out. Later on, in the early 50s, the worst thing you could be in the whole world was obvious. Mm. That's in our community, mind you, being obvious, being easily identified as homosexual or gay. So can't have anything to do with her. We used a sexist language in the old days. Men called one another she or her. You can't have anything to do with her because she's obvious. Mm -hmm. Gee whiz, what self-hatred that represents, doesn't it? Well, but it's understandable. I mean, if everyone is telling you that you're the worst thing in the world, it seems to me to be forgivable to, to have that degree of self-hatred. But you, but you, I, don't, I never experienced you as ever expressing that you were ashamed never. yourself in never. any way. Never. Isn't that marvelous? Uh, I know that sounds a, a little, well, it sounds. In any case, I tell you, Sheila Q, that I never in my lifetime had the slightest guilt feeling about being into man-man sexuality. I never wanted to see a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a minister, a counselor, a teacher, anybody. I just thought it was good for me, it was fine for me. I, I just didn't ever have any guilt feelings. And isn't that wonderful? That gave me a leg up early on because I felt I needn't deal with that. I could deal with other people who were feeling guilty. I could deal with other people who were in trouble or troubled. And gee whiz, there was such a lot of in trouble lesbian women and gay men, such a lot of troubled gay and lesbian people. A um, man I, I knew was into uh, younger sex. Mm -hmm. It was a very dangerous thing and he got in court. I was sentenced to a psychiatrist one hour a week. And uh, he saw the psychiatrist, he talked about his skills. He was an opera singer, very good by the way, would have mounted to something hadn't been of us. and. He called me one day saying, oh, he's found out. Mm. He knows. I've been revealed. I said, Frank, what are you talking about? He said, he knows that I'm like that. I said, You're paying the guy a hundred bucks a week uh, <laughs> to tell him your story. And he takes it a little leadership explaining who you are and you're unwilling to do that and you're complaining. That, mind you, that was 1957. So. Well, you had, uh, how did you get to California? I know you took your degree at uh, Texas Christian. It was quite Christian. deliberate. I was in northern New Mexico, and I was doing some underground organizing. Underground in that people who were self-identified as gay knew that I was of service. I have training in social service, and they knew that I would be helpful on a non-judgmental basis. And I was doing more and more of that. And I was conscious in 1957 that we could have a gay revolution, nonviolent, of course. And uh, I traveled around the country a lot. Uh, the most likely place in the world to do that from was Los Angeles. I'd visited here a lot. I had tested the waters. I had learned a lot about life on Bunker Hill downtown, where I had friends, and, and I felt at home there. And so in 1957, I just disassociated from everything. I resigned from the New Mexico Conference on Social Welfare. I uh, resigned from all kinds of committees and activities, and so, including environmental, including Native American concerns, another concern of mine. And uh, so I moved to Bunker Hill. I settled at 341 South Hope Street, where now the first interstate bank yes. building is, way up high, 60, 70 stories. I was on the, the ground 
341 South Hope Street, where I paid $35 a month rent. Lights, water, and gas included. Didn't cover a phone, because the phone was big. I spent lots of money for a phone. And from that location, I passed the word that I had a, a degree in social service, that I uh, have a degree in public administration, that I could be of service to troubled or in troubled people, and I started getting calls. The first calls were timid, how to come on to me, how to talk to me, and whether to trust me or not. And as people developed that trust, they passed the word. There was nobody else. There was just nobody else. And they passed the word, and I served more and more and more, and uh, picked up more and more skills. And then urban removal came to Bunker Hill and improved it and wrecked all those elegant old homes and also slum dwellings. And I moved to Westlake Park, which turned out to be terribly fortuitous. I hit Westlake Park just when it was no longer where the great rich lived, they'd fled, leaving behind great old houses and smart shops and uh, diet stores and vegetarian stores and walking in the streets and it was just heaven. Westlake Park itself was the ideal place. Fishing and boating and traveling at night, we'd go around the park. It's not that anymore, now it's something else. But at that time, it was the perfect place to organize from. And knowing that we didn't have any social life except bars, I had at my house, which is at 716 South Bonnie Bray, I had on That's Friday. That's by Good Samaritan Hospital, not, not far uh, Good from Samaritan there, right? is not far away. Right, uh -huh. uh, Not far away. Uh, Good Samaritan is four blocks east, so yeah. The railroad, the trolley, ran down the middle of the street. And we'd go out and leave on the trolley and go down 10 cents downtown. In any case, I had receptions on Friday night. I had uh, a party on Saturday, our Jean Vizina who was at 613 and a half South Coronado on the other side of the park. Indeed, there was a trail, a road, a <laughs> walkway ran through the park from Gina's house to my house. Gina entertained on Saturdays, or I entertained on Saturday, or I always had a reception on Sunday afternoon. The monitor rap groups, H. Rap Brown, a black revolutionary in, in New Jersey, invented the phrase rap, because his first name was rap. Talk, talk, talk. Be, what that became, I was doing. We had, what's it like to be gay? How do you get that way? How, what do you do about it? You have an arrest, what do you do? Uh, a friend gets killed, how do you handle that? That's serious business. Now, Morris, this, but in, in terms of your community organizing and the work that you were doing now in the, in the late 50s, it was not the first that you had been involved uh, in no. community organizing. I no, mean, you I, really cut your teeth on other kind of, as many of us did a little bit later, in other movements. That, uh, even, think, but even during the war, I, yeah. I, I, I remember think you told me. I think that possibly is the one thing which puts me out there, is that I've always been to coalition politics. I believe that many hands make little work. If lots of people believe something, and lots of people take a little of this and do a little of that, and somebody else raise a little money here, and somebody else got a leaflet here. So when I came here, I involved myself with the Watchtower Preservation Committee. The city of Los Angeles wanted to put down this, push down this marvelous folk art project down in Watts, created by Simon Rodia, as appeal to America. He was an Italian immigrant, and he felt that it was reaching to the sky with colored glass and junk, but it was all put together. And so they wanted to put it down, and I joined the Watchtower Preservation Committee, and that prevailed. At the time, the Latino, Latina population of the Chavez Ravine were being evicted from their houses to make room for a modern housing project. Somebody somewhere said it's not a modern housing project at all, it's a scheme to get the land to have a baseball stadium. And so I joined in their defense, knowing that I nor no one else could avoid their eviction. But at least we could fight for them to get fair price. So I joined that as a gay person. And school segregation was a major problem, it still is, still a problem. And so I felt that that was de denying access to other cultures. And were you welcome in these other movements as, a, as an openly gay man? Uh, not, not entirely. Not entirely. There, was, there were barriers. However, I didn't accept the barrier. And I think that's another reason why my coalition politics has worked better than 
maybe anybody else except maybe you, <laughs> and is that I wrote it over. I just didn't pay any attention. I said, well, I won't deal with that because if I deal with that, then I have to educate them. And so I do the education the other way around. By revolution by example, I think is the phrase in Gandhi. Revolution by example, that you indicate that there's a better way. And they say, well, gee whiz, this guy's kind of OK. And so I did that until 1965, when I had a dramatic change, almost a 180 degree turnaround in my life. The war in Indochina arose. And since I'm a Ganjan pacifist, and since I felt that the war was the wrong place, the wrong time, the wrong enemy, the enemy was us, I dropped out of the underground gay and lesbian activity to join the war, fighting against the war. And that turns out to be terribly fortuitous. Since I had worked with a lot of lesbian gay people, I invited them to join me in the Dow Action Committee. I had formed the Dow Action Committee to zap Dow Company for the manufacture of napalm, herbicides, and defoliants. I invited them to join me. Most didn't, saying I was a communist, a communist sympathizer, un-American, un so what? Words, words, words. But enough did. And then in the Dow Action Committee, they found they could express themselves as gay persons. There was that personal liberation. And they found how to write leaflets and how to commit civil disobedience how to deal with an arrest, how to deal with the press, how to deal with the police, how to deal with spy agencies. They learned how to cope. And some of those same folk joined me in the Gay Liberation Front in 1969. We used the Dow Action Committee as our training school. You have to get your training somewhere. It doesn't, right. it's just doesn't happen. You just don't suddenly leap up in the streets and say, I am. You, you have to learn how to say that. And so they joined me. and. The rest is glorious history. Well, the rest of the glorious history, though, is uh, it needs more than just a few sentences. Because here you were, uh, your house was kind of a, uh, as you painted it, a social center, though, more than that. A, 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 a refuge, almost, it was a, a for refuge. members of the community. It was an organizing place. It was your a phone bill was, uh, was so enormous that the phone company was probably sending you flowers. Safe house, <laughs> a safe house, a place where people could come and rest and get a respite. I, uh, I moved on 4th Street, and a Latina lived across the street from me, and she called me one day and said, I need to see you in a hurry. So I rushed over, and she said, the FBI want to rent my front room to spy on your house. Hmm. And I told her, I don't want to do that. I didn't understand that. that there's nothing I want to deal with. But however, I need to tell you that they saw Dr. Martin Luther King come in your house, and they photographed that. They saw Reyes Lopez Tijerina come, and they photographed that. They saw Ann Braden come, and they freaked out because Ann Braden was up to here in, in radical organizing in the South. So yes, I used it as a headquarters. We wrote leaflets there. Uh, we uh, organized from there. We used the telephones from there. And uh, from there, then we went out. We went to the new federal building downtown constantly. We went to the old federal building. We went to police station and demonstrated. It was red-tagged on every spy agency in the country, particularly the military. They took it hard that I was fighting so hard to get honorable discharges for in-service gay persons. And uh, they, they wanted to try to talk me out of that. I said, please don't, don't, don't try to talk me out of something that makes sense. Either you keep them in or you give them an honorable discharge. And so they wanted to know, what about specific sex acts? I said, no, we won't talk about that. I won't allow this man to tell you that he has whatever. I won't do that. You just either accept him or you throw him out. So that was my life. And uh, I loved every moment of it. We went to the Dow Action Committee every Monday. We met every Monday night. Meetings were alive, and they were terribly gay and terribly lesbian, and we danced. And then we went to the Bamboo Inn, a Chinese-American restaurant at the corner of 7th and Westlake. We loved it. The food was cheap, and believe me, we were on the cheap, $1.65 for a full-course dinner. So we went one evening. Our meeting was later than usual. 
we had a fireplace in the meeting room, and we were in front of the fireplace. It was all terribly romantic. I mean, people were dying in Vietnam. We were sitting in the fire, fireplace. Mm -hmm. So we went to the bamboo inn, and nobody was there but us. So they locked the door, and uh, we ordered, and they went in the back room and talked among themselves. And they came out with a fortune cookie that they had used their Chinese-American fortune cookie friends to make. And so they presented them to us. They said, open them. So open them and said, be warned, you are being watched by the FBI. <laughs> Everybody had the same fortune cookie. And then they said, you don't know what it's like to serve you. Every Tuesday of the world, they show up here. Did you leave any leaflets? Did you leave any notes? Did you make any marks on napkins? Who was with you? Martin Luther King was with us one evening, and they wanted to know about that. Who was he sitting with? And where did Reyes Lopez Tijerina, uh, distinguished New Mexican, uh, nonviolent revolutionary, uh, was with us? They wanted to know what it was like. Mind you, this was as a gay person, and there were gay persons among us. And at first, I think that was a barrier. But gee whiz, you can grow used to anything. Isn't the name of the show? Get, get used to it. Well, you can get used to it, can't you? <laughs> and so they said, well, give up on them. They're just going to be gay last minute, so what do we do about that? But it's interesting, people working for their own liberation are always tagged as some kind of uh, communists or socialists or radicals or as though that you know, is a dismissive way to do it, when it's really a pretty strong organizing tool to say, 19, this is a community. 1955, two FBI men came into my house at 610 12th Street Northwest, Albuquerque, New Mexico, flashed their badges and said, standing, Mr. Kite, are you communist and homosexual? I said, whatever kind of question is that coming from you? There's no federal law of any kind controlling homosexual behavior. There's no law for you to enforce. So why are you asking me that? Also, there is no federal law to regulate membership in the Communist Party. Oh, you wish there were, but there isn't. And so that question is irrelevant. So why are you here? Well, it was a, no, no, why are you here? And uh, I, the, the, I just halted the conversation and then talked to them. That was in 1955. Heaven only knows what my FBI dossier must be like. I started with Dr. Leo Zillard, S-Z-I-L-A-R-D, one of the developers of the atom bomb, Los Alamos, New Mexico. Albuquerque is not far from Los Alamos. Right. And after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he knew that was wrong, that that was immoral. And uh, so he used his scientific credentials and his PR to talk about it. Imagine living in northern New Mexico and fighting against the atom bomb. It was well, where people were getting their living. And that tagged me on the FBI. It's been an interesting love affair I've had with them. Well, I, I imagine under the Freedom of Information Act, they would have to bring your records to you in crates because I, just, uh, I, I, just I think you were to, probably on everybody's list, the state I, list. I don't want to the, do that. I, I don't, that's a serious question, and, and you deserve an honorable response. I don't want to do that. I don't want to use the Freedom of Information Act because, for one thing, there were so many spy agencies. The government has 22 regular spy agencies, and so I'd have to write them all. That would take a lot of time. And then I would have to call them LD. I could be calling somebody to get them out of jail. I'd be somebody uh, serving somebody who was troubled. Instead of calling them, I would say, what about? And then they would come, and then it would be big. And there'd be names of people whom I've worked with who weren't all that trustworthy. I just don't think I, I don't think I want to do that. Well, you're probably right. But you know, um, when you mentioned you were uh, involved in the, uh, in the Dow Action Committee, uh, start, you know, helped to start it. And from that, there was a kind of uh, epiphany about, uh, of activism and bringing people into it and people increasingly out. Uh, but there's a next move, really, in your life that had to do with, with truly organizing in the community and the, and the origin of our center. Will you tell about that? I'm so glad you used the word epiphany. I got my epiphany October 17, 1969 in the polo grounds of Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. It's big, huge, uh, and we had an anti-war march. Big, 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 heavy mobilizing. And the, we, we built a stage, four stories tall, way up on pipes and boards. And I looked out across the crowd, 
And uh, I had an inspiration that a lot of Vietnam veterans among them. I had the administration of going to the microphone and saying, I see there are a great many Vietnam veterans here. I guess that many of you have medals, and I think you're not awfully proud of them. We have a made an arrangement to send them to the Pentagon. Those of you who want to shed your medals, throw them there. And so the whole stage was, you know, we were walking around medals, and we boxed them up and sent them to the Pentagon. <laughs> Denied. We don't want And so as the afternoon went along, 350,000 people out here, most of them very young, most seeing the dentist every six months. Their teeth were whiter and cleaner than ours. Most were better dressed. They were cleaner. They went to the laundromat more than we did. They, they had homes and family and connections. And I had a, an epiphany. Uh, let me tell something for the first time in my lifetime, and I hope I don't become emotional. A song came in my mind. I'm going home. In 1926, my mother prepared a picnic lunch. She was not a terribly romantic person, but this was very romantic. She prepared the picnic lunch. She said, children, we're going to be with your father today for lunch. And so the three of us walked, bagging the, the, the basket, up to a field where he was plowing. My father was a vigorous, athletic man, and he was a free man. And he was singing, I'm going home. And, and she said, let's pull back and let your father. And so there the three of us stood at the edge of the woods while my father was singing, I'm going home. Meaning, of course, going home. But I stood on that platform and said to myself, I'm going home. And Cecil Williams, uh, Reverend Cecil Williams, came to me. Uh, Dalton Trumbo, the Academy Award winner, who won it under a made-up name. They came to me and they said, something's happening to you. I said, yes, I'm having a, what the Southern Baptists call a revelation. I was just, I could hardly wait to speak. I wanted to get to the microphone. The moment I got there, I left the stage and went down a tunnel and up to the in Judah car on, on Van Ness Avenue mm -hmm. and rode downtown and went to the airline terminal, uh, got a PSA ticket to LA, $12. Believe me, everybody, PSA tickets from San Francisco, LA were $12 and 90s. I hope you take my word for it. And I paid $12 to come home and all night resigned from committees and groups and so on. The following day, I called the first meeting of the Gay Abortion Front, and the first meeting occurred at a storefront up on Cahuanga Boulevard. Sixteen people came, and I said, now we're here to create a radical activity for lesbian and gay people. And they all wanted to know not how bad that is, but how good that is. How do you get radical? And I knew full well that I was on top of, of nonviolent dynamite, that I was, there was some synergy going on. And so, as a community organizer, you paid me a great compliment, a true one, when I am a community organizer. I knew that we had to have something dramatic. And so, I suggested that we march down to Santa Monica Boulevard and take the faggot stay out sign down from Barney's Beanery. Barney's Beanery, a restaurant, since we're seen all over the country, we have to explain. It was a restaurant on Santa Monica, still there. They had a big sign. Actually, let's show them the sign because Morris brought this sign, and while we discuss it, maybe you'd like to take a look at it. Spelled F-A-G-O-T-S. Right, wrong That's as usual. That's alternative spelling. That's an okay spelling. There are two spellings. But I don't think Barney Anthony knew that. I think it was an ignorant old man, and he was with his chalk pencil, he made it faggot stay outside. To me, it was the same as colored waiting room, or whites only, or colored right, right. in the South. It was just saying that we were inferior, and worse still, we put up with it. Think that from 1950, to 1969, we tolerated that. Doesn't that say something about the fact that we needed to a uh, kick? We needed somebody to say, come on, fight back. Don't put up with this nonsense. And so we went there and picketed for three weeks. We did a change in. It's a kind of a tacky thing to do, but the nonviolent warfare has its own rules. We, we went to change a bill. Could you break a 20? Uh, no, I. I don't think I wanted to break a 20, I wanted to break a 10. Um, maybe a 20 after all. Uh, we did a, a uh, shop in, ordered coffee, the cheapest thing on the menu, and sat at the table with it, occupying, paying space. And uh, we drove the owner to madness. It took three <laughs> weeks. And came off with the sign, which we uh, must know, weeks, because here it is. At right? the end of three weeks, a 
tactful deputy, there are tactful deputy sheriffs. Absolutely. They're good ones, great officers, some of them. And he came and said, we want you off the street. You're attracting a lot of attention. You're giving a lot of notoriety. What would it take to, I said, have the owner agree to give us the sign, never discriminate against gay and lesbian persons in service, never discriminate gay and lesbian persons in hiring. This deputy went to the owner and he said, no, I won't agree to that. So we'll just go right back. Oh, yay, <laughs> give me a G, give me an A, give me a Y, give me a P, <laughs> give me a... And so we were right back. He said, you're just going on. I said, please, of course we're going on. We have work to do. Three days later, the owner agreed and gave us the sign. Mind you, that part of it was that the sign would go away and never reappear. In 1984, when the city of West Hollywood was formed, one of the first responsibilities of the new city council was to march to Barney's Meadery and take down the reincarnated faggot stay outside. I guess the story is that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. That's right. If you ever let up, they'll move in on you. You now have it to. It was very interesting, Morris, that, that I mean, obviously being a, a very experienced organizer, but to bring together people uh, for this uh, for the gay liberation meeting and 16 people show up and when you said you were kind of on a powder keg of nonviolence uh, it's a very interesting uh, phrase but I know what you mean there's an energy there that needs to be directed and your decision was the energy should be directed in an action in a demonstration which we had also learned from the Reverend King and from Gandhi and others that it's it's also like bearing witness to show up in order that something be done and what you characterize as these sort of uh, petty pieces of Quoting taking the tables, you know, from Gandhi. Uh, well, making change, etc. Yeah. It's all very effective. I'm being interviewed a lot by uh, writers, journalists, and so on, and they ask, did I ever get depressed? I don't know where the question come from. <laughs> Never did I ever get depressed. I do, however, contemplate. And my contemplation is Mohandas K. Gandhi. He knew you had to write. He knew you had to publish, and so he published magazines and newspapers and Prasad and on and on and on, and so there's a bulk of writing. And that divination is there, that he had to sell other Indians, other residents, other Hindis, other Muslims, he had to sell them on how to do nonviolent warfare. Could you imagine the march to the sea to get salt? Here they came in phalanxes, and went and faced the British troops who beat them down and clubbed them and the women carried the men away and the next wave came and the next wave came and finally the troops walked away. They couldn't stomach beating people who didn't fight back. That's how India came about. They're celebrating their 50th birthday right now. Isn't it marvelous? It is marvelous. Nonviolent warfare is the only way particularly for lesbian gay people, if we'd ever armed ourselves, it would have given them all the excuse in the world to march in to on the spot. wipe us out, of course. Uh, the tanks would have been in front of our houses. Well, and Dr. King said, we will wear them down with our suffering. And it was, at the time, you want to go, no, 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 you know, we really need to fight back. But when you're outgunned, um, and when the moral virtues are really on your side, then you say, over time, people will see it. Now, I'm curious, though, I have a question, because we were homosexuals for so long, and then suddenly it seems like we were gay. Yes. Do you know the origin of, of this word for us? It, co it comes from two places, or their theory is everything, but the two, I believe, are French theater, uh, that Guy was, Guy, G-A-I, Guy, was being different, uh, being made up, uh, mm -hmm. wearing a Harlequin outfit, projecting beyond yourself. And so, tomorrow we march against the enemy. You know, that was Guy. Uh -huh. It was a different way of life. It was, it was a sorority, a fraternity, or the other, and I think the other one I like the most, comes from Scott's Guy, G-A-I, Scott's, describes uh, a woman who lives out the edge of town, has a lot of trees and flowers and birds and things around and, f and chickens, and takes care of wounded birds and animals and has herbs and berries and seeds to share and counsels the children. I think in another world it's called witch. <laughs> That's called guy. Mm -hmm. And isn't it a noble thing to be? It Can't is you now, but we, didn't we have to reclaim all of that? Yes, we do. And make it honorable. Make it seem 
realistic, and, and, and then you get the whole business of science. Science has, is a marvelous thing, but science will get you nowhere. Science will get you to manufacturing the atom bomb. Mm. They were scientists. They never thought of what they were going to do with the bomb. They never thought it was going to roast 250,000 people alive. And worse still, they never thought of what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so we're all turning phosphorescent. I can see that you're getting a little, your cheek, you're getting a little phosphorescent. Absolutely, I'm touched. Ward Valley, here in California, near the Colorado River, on a, on a subsoil moisture plain, an aquifer, they're planning to plant dead atom bombs, dead atomic energy there. We can't get rid of it. We have it everywhere. They plan a tunnel in, uh, in Nevada, uh, thousands of feet down. That same spot where they're going to place the wasted energy was 10,000 feet deep in the Ice Age. The Ice Age came down, the Ice Age obliterated everything, and we wouldn't know this there. I think what I'm saying is that science has a place, but you need to humanize it, bring people back to humanity. Well, and it was science that was, in a way, our enemy. The, in, in, whenever you talk about unnatural, whenever you talk about what science knows for sure to be natural, it's all sort of politically or culturally manipulated. I mean, this notion that uh, I know that the, the right wing, for instance, now, uh, just this month is saying, uh, well, the gays are not like African Americans, because African Americans' race is fixed. It is immutable, at, but sexual orientation is not. And so some of what we're saying back is, oh, yes, it is. Uh, we know that it is. We know when we're born what we are. Thereupon hangs one of the contradictions that I've had to deal with, is that, yes, indeed, being lesbian gay is a natural thing, a natural state, a natural af sort of affair, that sexuality is from here to here, and on the Kinsey scale of 10, some people are out here vigorously heterosexual, and some people are moving in and in, and, and sometimes there's a little crossover on that. That's a perfectly natural thing. However, when you turn that into a rhetoric, and you say to somebody who's trying to oppress you, please don't oppress us. We're just a result of nature. You know, mm -hmm. nature made us this way. Then you're almost apologizing. There's an another way of saying that. I am. Deal with it. <gasps> so right. Uh, Morris, I wanted to kind of move us to from here we are kind of having a, a gay and lesbian center operating out of your house. Yes. Uh, people calling, people yeah. coming by, doing rap yeah. groups. Yeah. Uh, but we, we eventually moved to more of an organizational structure, and I know you were instrumental in that. Let's talk, Tell us about that. Let's talk that. about how it was done. When you found a, what is to be a major, and it, heaven knows it's major, social service organizations, the very first thing the planners do is to provide a needs assessment. What is the need? Why do you need this place? We didn't need to do that because I had conducted a needs assessment from Bunker Hill in 1957, from Westlake Park and from Hollywood. I had determined that the needs were to be uh, affirmation, counseling, uh, techniques in coming out, techniques of expression, that was number one. The next second need was alcohol. Alcohol was a serious problem for us. If everybody you see says you're sick, central deviant, and variant, so you can finally say, well, just got drunk and forget it. Mm -hmm. So alcohol was a major problem. Syphilis and gonorrhea were syphilis, gonorrhea, hepatitis, scabies, herpes, herpes simplex, major problems. That's the reality of life. Yeah, that sexually transmitted diseases are real for everybody, so we had to deal with that. And we had to deal with housing because property owners found reasons not to rent to you. So, oh, the apartment was rented just a moment ago. Or employers. Employer would, if you were a minute over 30, an employer would come to you and say, we'd like to promote you, but we see that you don't seem to have a wife. Mm. And you get your mail at a post office box. You don't live in a post office box, do you? This company is a family-oriented company, and the best we can do is chief of the mailing room. That's an advance because you were just a mailing clerk. So employment was a very real problem. And uh, the whole business of, of integrating, establishing enclaves, establishing enclaves, and we've done that. And so all those components of reality, 
the fact that, uh, that our families, the nuclear family, we love them all, but they mistook us for sick. And so they sent one of my counselees off for electroconvulsive shock therapy mm -hmm. in 1955. And he's still a counselee of mine. He doesn't want to break the habit of relying upon me. Mm -hmm. And he's not gestalt, he's not whole, because 220 volts of electricity went through his body mm -hmm. to burn out of him his desire for homosexual contact. It did that, but also left him stuttering and stammering and he runs into walls. He's not whole. And so all those things led me to join with a cadre from the Gay Liberation Front. In the Gay Liberation Front, it met at 555 and a half north of Vermont on the second floor. At a meeting in April of 1971, I said to a meeting of the Gay Liberation Front, I think we should soon disband because I think we've done our work. I almost had to be saved from the mob. <laughs> These nonviolent people said, why you rat fink? How dare you double cross us? Anyway, of course you're a sellout. I said, say what you want. You will find out that we have done our work. We disabuse gay people of any notion of their alleged inferiority because we are not inferior. Indeed, I had to fight people who wanted to become superior. We're better than anybody else. Well, you're just as good. But. And so all that then led to a cadre who met to dis uh, discuss a proposed gay community services center. Gay services center, not, because we had, yes. lesbians didn't not get, not lesbian yet. Lesbian didn't get the I remember the day that they added, and lesbian in handwriting. Yeah, in 1980. Right. And so uh, we met, and then uh, again an epiphany occurred. The Los Angeles police, uh, in the presence of a sergeant, called me to say, Mr. Kite, We've heard your comments about us, so, so we know what you think of us. However, we can be right. And we are telling you that you're running a potentially very dangerous activity. We had a storefront at 4400 Melrose, two storefronts, 100 feet wide and 150 feet back. And because we were kind people, because we were decent people, we provide food and, and so on. And we also had mattresses that we put on the floor at night to house the homeless. Then the non-gay homeless moved in on us and they started exchanging body lice with the lesbian and gay people and started fist fights and broke out the uh, front window. Mm -hmm. And so the sergeant of police said, I'm telling you, sir, it's over. You just can't go on. And I realized he was right because he was bringing me up to date. And so I called a meeting with the guy front and I said, we're here to pay our bills, to give our possessions away, and we're here to do something else. And so in April of 1971, we had the first meeting of, gay, of the Gay Community Services Center. The first activity was a house on Edgemont, a seven bedroom house, $175 a month, how things have changed. And so we housed people there and also did our business from there. And then in October of 1970, 90, uh, 1971, we went to 1614 Wilshire Boulevard. The press called it a mansion. It was really kind of good-natured slum. It was an Eastlake-designed house, so terribly interesting, but thin and really used up. It was 100 years old. The, the floorboards were six-inch wide pine, and for mopping, they had bucked up. The, you know, there mm -hmm. was an interstice between the cracks. And uh, so October 17, 1971, we got the lights on and got the gas on and got the key and we started calling people to say we're open tonight and uh, 19 people came not particularly to seek any service we were not prepared they wanted to be to be to be a part of that moment John Vincent Platania one of the co-founders of the center uh, is kind of a mystical man and he recognized that something was happening and that maybe a little mystery would be okay and so he started chanting, Amen, 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 Om, 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 Shalom. And I shot a glass around the room and people were weeping and they were clutching one another. They were into a moment of history. And now, all these many years later, a uh, four story building and a lot of property around and well established and world famous and the first of what may be a thousand. Mm -hmm. 
they're in Asia, in Europe, and so on. But they all had their genesis in the sitting room at 716 and a half South Bonnie Bray, where somehow or another I was able to create a symbiosis. I was able to create a symbiotic relationship that we could be better, that we could be different, that we could be gestalt, that we could belong to one another. In those faraway days, I talked about, a lot about lesbian gay enclaves, and now we have them. Castro District Center, it's just heaven, isn't it? Montrose in Houston. The moment you get there, you can tell that something has changed. Suddenly you're gayer, you're more lesbian, you're with brothers and sisters. Uh, Greenwich Village in New York City. I founded Stonewall 25 uh, several years ago to, to celebrate the Stonewall Rebellion. And I projected it to be an international celebration, and oh, it was. And I went to Greenwich Village and held a news conference in Christopher Park next to the George Siegel sculptures of and the press came, and, and they realized that I, that I was loaded. I was, I was full of it, and they took <laughs> advantage of that, and the cameras panned in. And so that we would create an enclave in the North Beach in San Francisco, uh, in Chicago, South Beach in Miami. It's so gay, you just, it's all there is. I mean, you, you, gee whiz, get used to it, we're gay. <laughs> well, it's been, um a good 25 years, more than 25, I guess, since the, uh, since the center started. Uh, it's an extraordinary time for us now. And so just in the few remaining moments, I'd sort of like to ask you a, a couple of things. Uh, one is your opinion of the, of the queer youth, of the young people coming up who are taking so much for granted, but uh, also very um, sort of active in their own way. Tell me what you think. A uh, very painful question that came very late in the show. So let me talk a little bit. If we run out of time, just say we have time's up. Uh, the youth. I'm thrilled and despairing about gay youth. I'm thrilled that they have a place to call. The telephone directory is filled. With, you know, they have a place to go for free. Just get the bus fare, get there. I'm, that there are opportunities. There's socialization. There's the Eagle School. There, there are gay youth caucuses all over. However, the other half of that is not so good, is that if you're born black, you know full well that you, in your lifetime, are going to suffer some discrimination. But you're black, and you belong, and there is a community. And being young is just part of the concern. If you're Chicano, Chicana, Latina, Latina, you all know, you know that sometimes you can be If you're a woman, you know full well that sometime or another you're going to be called a name or treated as inferior or treated as a servant. If you are gay, nobody knows that. The attending physician, the midwife, the mother, the father, the minister, nobody knows that. Nobody knows that except you. And you learn that before you're three years old. And you also learn that there's nothing to talk about. There's nothing that you mention with any pride because you get beaten up or thrown out or so on. And so the first 18 years of our life are a period of great denial. Mm -hmm. If only we could find out how to cut through that. If only we could say to non-gay people, please allow us to be brothers and sisters to our young brother and sister. I swear we won't molest. We just will love. If only we could break through that, then we could go to total liberation, to total restart. But we can't. And I challenge out there everybody, the philosophers of the, of the world, help us to find out how to deal with our younger brothers and sisters that we can love them and not be arrested. Well, there's a celebration that I'm going to uh, at the end of this millennium, at the end of this century, uh, the celebration of your 80th birthday. Yes. And it's also a little more than 40 years of activism, but I think we're calling it... Uh, 4080. 4080. Morris Kite, 4080. I'm right. 40 years old this year, and friends are saying coalition building and founding and dynamism and creation and vision and so on. And in November 19, 1999, Nine. I'll be 80. That's just a few weeks before a brand new millennium, a whole thousand years. And here I'll be just at the edge of it. Won't that be fun? It's going to be a great party. You know, a lot of us are saying to ourselves, now how am I going to celebrate this turn of the century? My grandmother told me stories about the turn of the century from the 19th the one, to the, the 20th. And I have been thinking probably for 50 years, now what am I going to do to celebrate this? And Come I think what's going to happen is Morris's party will start in November and it won't stop yeah. until January. That's so that really true. solves our Won't problem. it be wild? Won't it be wonderful? 
the band will come, and the men's chorus. And uh, if they don't know how to sing it between now and that time, I'll get an expert to teach them how to sing, We Shall Overcome. And what about we coming home? We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Someday, today. Won't that be wonderful? Be A wonderful. whole big room full of people all singing. Can't you clutch somebody even now? And what about coming home? The yeah. The song that you told us about. I grow so emotional about that. And moreover, it kind of insinuates me into a form of Christianity. And while I'm understanding of all religions, I'm a proud humanist. I'm a card-carrying humanist. It simply means that given a level playing field and given some rules of decency and equality and fair treatment that all people can be achieving, happy, healthy, wouldn't that be wonderful? And it seems to me that the, the hallmark of your life, if I may be so bold, has been a, a, a very successful yet unending attempt to create a place. I mean, I was very struck by your talking about this song and your father singing and the notion of coming home, um, to create a place that is welcoming, not discriminating, not filled with hatred, but welcoming, no matter what your sexual orientation, your gender, your religion, your race, um, your work on the Human Rights Commission here. Uh, what would you say, in, in our sort of wrap-up, what lesson would you want to leave with our viewers about um, the, the way you've lived your life and what, what recommends it? Never again. Never again will we treat as sick, sinful, deviant, valiant. We're whole, we're gestalt, we're achieving, we're earning, we're learning, we're mobilizing, we're real, we're of service, we have something to offer the world, and we invite them to share it with us, to welcome us to, to the table, that at the table we can all be co-equal. Get used to it. Hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Morris Kite, thank you very much. I hope that you'll make it an international celebration, Morris's 80th birthday in November of 1999. Until then, this is the joyful, the creative, and the visionary uh, man and part of our movement. So glad you were here. Get used to it.